Hi, and welcome in this new country deep dive about the United States. I have the pleasure to welcome Dennis Greg, head of fleet at Polestar US, to present the latest fleet EV trends in the United States. Dennis, the floor is yours. My fleet friends, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining. My name is Dennis Craig. I'm head of fleet for Polestar in North America. I'm excited you're here and I'm excited to discuss a little bit about what's going on in the U.S. in terms of fleet adoption. Um, first and foremost, I just want to you know, say this. We hope you and your family are staying healthier and getting the proper care you need as we come out of this global pandemic. And uh, I'm sure you're like me and just can't wait to get down to Miami in the fall to break bread, have a few drinks together, and uh, catch up. It's been a while. So thanks again for joining. I don't have a ton of time to go through all that I want to go through, but let's just touch on uh, a few things. Let's jump into the module. Dear car industry, this will not be easy. Look at us. Is this what we've become? The things we share are all too rare. The times we find common ground are all too seldom. It seems you can't make up your mind. On one hand, you look to the future with visions of a better tomorrow. But on the other, you cling on to the past going round in circles. We're just too different. Everything has its time. Everything comes to an end. Promises won't work anymore. Things need to change fast. So from now on, we have to go our separate ways. Sometimes, it's time to move on. So for, for my background, real, real quick, I, I did spend a le- the last 11 years with one of the big three in Detroit. And, um, you know, I came over to Polestar about four months ago and quickly learned that Um, we're just really far behind. We do need to change and we do need to move towards the uh, electrification of our automotive industry. And most specifically, we need to start in the fleet industry. So real quick, in terms of how the fleet trends are for EVs, you can tell that, you know, like we're we're definitely gaining market share uh, in the EV world. Uh, We do trail Europe and China quite considerably. but again, the, the share is growing. We're not quite to 3% in terms of total, to total uh, market share, but I do think that with some action items that we have, that we come away um, w- you know, speaking to our, um, our colleagues and, and going to modules like this, I think that the, the, the market trend will, will significantly grow over the next couple of years. And of course, OEMs continue to flood the market with new EVs, new brands, new nameplates. So, the you know the Rivians, Lordstown, Workhorse, Elms, um, Polestar, all these companies continue to join the ranks of where Tesla is. It's just going to continue to grow. So that's great. And of course, automotive interest rates continue to fall, which is great as we as we sit in a situation that COVID nineteen has has put us in in terms of a supply shortage or um, or in, in increased values of used cars. All these all these um, all these factors will help drive more volume and more volume into the EV space. When you look at the SAR, uh, you know, fleet only represents about 18 to 20 percent. So if you if you start to look at that and you volumize it, you can kind of see how that would shake up in terms of fleet sales. So obviously rental uh, represents about 1.8 million um, cars out of 16 SAR. Um, obviously that would go up a little bit with, it, with, with a 17 SAR. Um, you know, the government's driving, you know, obviously some, you know, some momentum into replacing the federal, the federal uh, fleet, but that represents about 200,000 cars. But really, where we can make a significant change um, outside of the rental, rental space is the, um, you know, the commercial space at about eight or 900,000 cars annually. So 
Um, let's move on here. Let's talk about some of the hurdles, that, the reasons why we're slowing the adoption of the EV. So, so I've been driving a Polestar 2 for the last four months. Um, never drove one before that in terms of uh, long term. Uh, and I got to say that when you start to talk about charging, uh, range anxiety, battery safety, the time to charge, all those things, so they all kind of are summed up into into uh, education really at the end of the day and you know like like i said if i if i can you know have a phone uh you know just on, on me at all times and and can keep it charged by plugging it in at night and, and having a full vehicle i'm sorry a full charge on my phone in the morning that's exactly what it's like to drive an electric vehicle every day unless you're planning on driving from uh, new york to to uh, la it doesn't get that difficult even even in the uh, outskirts outside of the small states the charging infrastructure is there you can use it but at the end of the day if you have one in your garage that's all you need and of course we we have seen tons of partnerships with fmc's and automotive and, and manufacturers and large clients uh, on the on the fleet side starting to partner with you know charging partners so I think that charging infrastructure, range anxiety, time to charge, it, it's not even really a factor. It's more of an excuse than anything. And, and, and we just need to you know, educate the end users and the board members and the fleet management companies, whoever it may be that's starting to push back on that and say, it's not that big of a deal. Now, acquisition costs is definitely one that I, that I you, you, you can't say is an excuse. It definitely is um, more expensive for EVs, but we'll get to that in, the, in a little bit on the TCO side. And of course, COVID-19 slowed the fleet down um, last, uh, last year. We're, we're seeing significant upticks because of uh, older product that need to be recycled. But it, it, now's, the, now's the, the time to start dipping your toe into the EV world if you're not already. In terms of sustainability, so a lot of that word gets thrown around a lot and a lot of a lot of times people have a different definition so what, what i ask from you is to ask yourself what is your definition of sustainability so if you look at it from an oem standpoint a lot of a lot of oems are saying we're going to be sustainable by 2030 by 2035 by 2040 um, that's that's one definition of sustainability if you're just going to electric vehicles now that's that's a great transition but it's not what sustainability really is. So for me, um, at Pol and, and at Polestar, sustainability is literally reducing your carbon footprint. So you can continue to build EVs, but if you're not focusing on climate neutrality, circularity, meaning you're repurposing products that are already in market and putting them in your car, being transparent about it, uh, not pretending like you know exactly uh, the right answer, but but collaborating with other manufacturers and other fleet industry partners or other automotive partners and being inclusive to everybody to make a way that we can all affect the change and be climate neutral together. So again, what is your definition of sustainability? If it's 100% e EV, that's fantastic for the EV infrastructure and the EV industry. So that's great. But it's better to partner with those companies that are going to affect the change long term. One of the key challenges for our industry is how to become more sustainable without sacrificing performance or aesthetics. The innovative composites from BCOM showcased in the precept are 50% lighter than traditional materials and reduce vibrations by an amazing 250%. They cut down on plastic content and waste material, and they're made from fully sustainable flax. We're on a journey towards greater sustainability, using sustainable materials in both the interior and exterior of our cars is a significant step in the right direction when they also offer new design possibilities and a new definition of premium it's even more significant so it's really important that you're partnering with the right companies the the those companies that have the direction to sustainability 
and Polestar is one of those. And that's just a just just one example. There are many more out there that are that are going down that path. So let's talk about pricing total cost of ownership. Uh, I mentioned earlier, yes, EVs cost more. They cost more to make. Uh, manufacturers have way smaller margins, but they should cost more than internal combustion. They're more valuable at the end of the term. And, and as we see more and more of these products getting into market and they're coming back uh, on the remarketing side, we'll start to see a little more consistent um, you know, residual value. Um, right now we're kind of dependent on one manufacturer you'll start to see more consistency on the back end and you'll be able to see that the, the RVs are higher um, for electric vehicles than they are for internal combustion. Yeah, so then the other side of it is, you know, FMCs need to find a consistent way to show clients the true total cost of ownership versus internal combustion. Um, mileage tends to be a little bit shorter in, on EVs because of the hurdles that we mentioned before. Uh, service is a lot, a um, lot different versus internal combustion. You have a 24-month interval on service. Uh, there's very little that go into um, servicing the, the, um, the EVs. Most things can be handled over the air. So at the end of the day, we need to do a better job of showcasing that. Um, obviously, fuel prices continue to rise on, on the uh, fossil fuel side. So that's only going to impact a greater disparity between EV and um, internal combustion in terms of uh, moving the vehicle. And as I mentioned before, residual values uh, are really only reliant on, on one manufacturer at this point. So overall, uh, I haven't seen a really good TCO uh, from, it, from anybody else in the industry and how to compare the two, but we, did, we, we, need, we need to put emphasis on that. Let's talk about availability real quick. Uh, as, as you all are sitting here thinking about ways to um, you know, find, find ways to, to get cars to put in your fleet, to recycle your fleet, or maybe you're looking at selling fleet. I mean, it's very difficult time right now because of the supply issues we have on the microchip. Um, what's next? We don't know. There's, there could be tire shortage. There could be some other, some other um, components that are going to be at a significant um, delay. So um, on top of that, we have startups and legacy manufacturers. They were throwing billions of dollars into, into this EV movement, right? So with the shortages, we, we continue to see the impact in that. And, and of course, a lot of that, you know, a lot of these companies have EV product, you know, at their disposal. So you're starting to see the growth occur because uh, there are now people, like for instance, people are calling me because I have units, units uh, at port ready to go. They'll be like, "How many can I get?" And and so, all, you know, the shortages in the industry are helping grow the EVs, which is great. But um, at the end of the day, you know, uh, we have to find a way to continue that momentum. And then on top of that, federal government uh, obviously announced that they want to flip their fleet to uh, EVs. That's obviously going to drive a higher market share. But at the end of the day, baby steps aren't going to move the needle. So we, we need to take advantage of the time that, that, uh, right now. And this, there's no better time. The used car prices are at an all-time high or near all-time high. So it's time to dump the ice and dip into the EV world. So what's next? What's going on in the fleet industry? So we have to do. We have to continue fighting the fight. We have to. We have to um, be the leading charge in electric electrification of vehicles in the U.S. We're going to continue at the retail. We're going to continue to sell. Um, you know, three, five, eight, fifteen percent um, percent uh, across the industry as as electric electric vehicles. But because of the volume opportunity, we can drive that even faster in fleet. So we need to partner. Manufacturers need to partner with FMCs and fleet managers. And we have to drive that EV adoption outside of California and New York. Um, let's face it, the infrastructure is there. It's, it's growing more and more every, every day. The hurdles we mentioned are more, more like excuses. We need uh, you know, clients and, and uh, fleet managers to, to push up manage up the fact that yes EVs do cost a little bit more but at the end of the day it's better for our planet and it's better for our residual values uh, and it just shows your you know your biggest asset your people that you that you actually do care about um, the you care about the planet and you care about them by putting them into electric vehicles 
Um, and then at, at the same time, the more EVs you put out there, the better it is for everybody else. You know, obviously the large manufacturers are all out there saying that they're going to be 100% electric by 2030, 2035, whatever it may be. That's great for everybody. That's great for us because sustainability does add equal value. There is there is a value component to that. So we, we need to make sure that when we're partnering in the fleet industry um, with you know OEMs and fleet management companies and customers alike, that we, we celebrate that. We, we, do a, we put out a press release every time we do a deal because the more that we can celebrate this in public, the more acceptance, the more adoption, and, and the better it is for our planet overall. And it's gotta come from large global companies, last mile delivery companies that have a ton, a ton of volume. Um, and then of course, the, the company car is benefit companies, right? Those guys, uh, those companies that, that are putting their salespeople in, in fleets, why not put them in electric vehicles? I mean, if they're, if they're driving less than 300 miles anyway, Put them, put them in, in these vehicles and, and see how um, that impacts change overall. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop, um, you know, kind of uh, talking about the EV trends. But I do want you to know that, um, you know, uh, Pol- Polestar is, is available today. We, we do have cars at port. We're, we're, moving, we're moving them. We delivered our first uh, fleet vehicles over the last 60 days. And, and uh you know, just if there's any questions that you have for me about what I presented today or anything on the Polestar front, please feel free to reach out to me. And uh, thanks again for your time. I look forward to seeing you all in Miami in the fall. And uh, until then, uh, best of luck and continue driving that change to electric vehicles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis Gregg from Polestar. We now know everything there is to know to electrify our fleet in the US. Ladies and gentlemen, don't hesitate to watch the other regional and country deep dives available for you in this section.